and I'll be facilitating today's session examining the um, national and international lessons. So we're going to start our day um, with the land acknowledgement and um, this acknowledgement recognized the lands and territories where George Brown College and Oise and the Greater Toronto are situated. So ask that you take a moment to um, acknowledge the traditional Indigenous lands of your home. Acknowledging land is something Indigenous people have been practicing for generations long before settlers arrived. Recognizing the land you are on is an expression of respect and gratitude. Officer Local 557 would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat, which is now home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We also acknowledge that Toronto is a treaty territory, a relationship between the Mississaugas of the Credit and Canada. This land is also part of the Dish With One Spoon Treaty, an agreement between the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and allied nations to peacefully share and care for the land. Other Indigenous people, settlers, and newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. This means we are all treaty people. As such, it is our responsibility to honour and respect this land and express gratitude for the opportunity to work on and share this land. All my relations, all my relations basically translates to we're all related. It's a reminder that everything in the universe is part of a single whole and is connected in some way to everything else. This means everything and everyone are our relatives and that they have a purpose and are worthy of respect and care, especially the land and each other. Thank you, miigwech, walaluk, all my relations. Um, we're going to start by recognizing that all of us are still reeling from the tragic truth of the discovery of the remains of the 250 children from Kamloops, um, which was called the Indian Residential School. This tragedy reveals once more that um, we need to recognize that we have more to work on in terms of truth. Uh, as we travel on the road to reconciliation. We're going to begin the day um, by uh, our panel and it's my privilege to introduce um, today's panel that come to us from as far as Belgium and Jamaica. They have a plethora of knowledge and experience and bring different perspectives to the ECEC. I'm gonna start off by introducing uh, Dr. Emise Akabari, who is a professor, a colleague, and a friend, and a program coordinator at the School of Early Childhood at George Brown College. She's also an adjunct professor in the Department of Applied Psychology and Human Development and the Senior Policy Fellow at the Atkinson Centre at OISE at the University of Toronto. Her work um, evaluates current and uh, changes in policy at all levels of government, Amis is the co-author of the Early Childhood Education Report, which you'll hear more about today. I also am pleased to welcome Cecile Manot, who is the director for the Consortium for Social Development and Research at the University of the West Indies Open Campus. She holds a master's in education with a specialization in counseling from the University of South Florida. Um, her interests um, circle around early childhood education and counseling. Cecile has developed and implemented the first laboratory preschool in Jamaica at the University of West Indies and is the lead for the team that developed the continuing education program in the early childhood education as well as the first online graduate research program in child, adolescent and youth studies for the University of West Indies open campus. She's collaborated with researchers, practitioners, and policymakers in developing policies, curricula, and the, in the training of early childhood teachers and in teacher training in the region. And please welcome Geraldine Libro, who is the policy officer for early childhood education and care in the Directorate General Education, Youth, Sport, and Culture of the European Commission. She's currently coordinating an expert group 
bringing together ministerial representatives from 34 European countries and representatives of trade unions, cities, children's interests, and so forth. The group explores efficient policies and practices to professionalize further the ECEC staff, as well as to increase inclusiveness in, of the ECE systems and settings. So please join me in welcoming this panel and we are going to begin with um, Emis. Thank you so much, Patricia. And I'm honored to be on a panel with uh, Cecile and uh, Geraldine. Um, I'm pleased uh, to announce today that our early childhood education report has been released this morning at 10 a.m. produced by the Atkinson Center for Society and Child Development at OISE at the University of Toronto and in partnership with George Brown College and the Center of Excellence for Early Childhood Development. The early education report is in its fourth edition and assesses the quality of ECEC services across the country. Today, I'll be giving you a snapshot of some of our results. The report was developed out of um, the policy lessons that emerged from the 20 country review of early childhood education by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in 2004. In the report, the OECD provided a prescription for countries to improve their ECC services. With this in mind, along with roundtable discussions with experts in various fields such as medicine, education, psychology, economics, and neuroscience, paired with the realities of limited, consistent, and reliable data across all 13 provinces and territories, 21 benchmarks of quality, across five equally weighted categories were created. These include governance. Are ministries integrated or fragmented? Is there a common policy framework that guides policy decisions? Funding, what percent of funding is allocated to early education? And what is that in relation to provincial and territorial budgets? Is there a managed salary and parent fee scale? Access, is public funding conditional on including children with special needs? What percent of children have access to regulated childcare? We look at the learning environment. Is there a curriculum framework that guides educator practice? Is the use of the curriculum mandatory? What percent of staff are qualified? And what are the salaries of ECEs? And we look at accountability. Are there annual progress reports that are in line with the bilateral agreements? Are there population measures to see how our children are doing? Together, these benchmarks total 15 points and give a snapshot of public investments in early learning and childcare across the country. The report captures the impact of the bilateral agreements that emerged from the 2017 multilateral framework in early learning and childcare. It is also based on pre-pandemic realities and its timing is such that it acts as a baseline to, so we can assess the impact of both the pandemic on the sector as well as the 2021 budget. As you may have already heard yesterday from my colleague and co-author, Carrie McQuaig, we will be releasing a detailed report on the workforce and the status of the workforce in early childhood across the country later this month. So I'd like to uh, share with you some of the results uh, of our report and I'll begin uh, looking at access. We are seeing a trend across the country where school boards are playing a significant role in educating younger children through kindergarten and pre-kindergarten programs. Where full day kindergarten or pre-kindergarten is available, uptake is as high as 100%. Where you're seeing on this chart, lower uptake are regions where they're in the process of a rollout. So we are really seeing a movement towards school board expansion, and as such, the view of early education as an entitlement. The 2017 federal funding prioritized access, quality, and inclusion, and had the goal to add 40,000 spaces across the country for children zero to five. We were able to report the addition of over 100,000 spaces current to March 31st, 2020. However, how the pandemic affected access is not yet clear. 
Many programs have collapsed under the financial stress brought on by COVID-19. We see across the country, many provinces and territories have made large improvements in access such as BC, Prince Edward Island, Manitoba, in regions here on this graph where you see a decrease in access such as in Nova Scotia or in Northwest Territories, it's because they have moved their four-year-old into the school programs in pre-kindergarten, making these spaces more stable to economic downturns and the impact of the pandemic. In this chart, you see access looking at two to four-year-olds only, uh, and this does not include family daycare. Here again, we see an uneven access across the country. Prince Edward Island has made notable leaps forward in access. The green dots are tw 2017 and the purple dots are 2020. They've gone from 55% in 2017 to 75% in 2020, while others have seen decreases. Overall, in this age group, when we don't include family daycare, we do see stagnant access. Now, although we have seen much investment and our report highlights that in inclusivity through grants to support the inclusion of children with special needs, only in three regions in Canada are the inclusion of special needs mandatory for programs receiving public funding. In Alberta and Prince Edward Island, early childhood services programs and early years centers respectively must, must include children with special needs. In Manitoba, any center receiving public money must do so. But with only three regions, again, this tells us, unlike education, early childhood education is not an entitlement in Canada. So what does funding look like across the country? A 25% increase in overall funding was seen just since 2017 with provinces and territories increasing their funding spurred by federal interest and investment. This is a noted difference of only 9% increase between 2014 and 2017, when federal interest was non-existent. This demonstrates that even small federal action can produce significant change, stimulating spending and improving access. Here on this graph, we can see the percent increase in ECC spending by province and territory between 2017 and 2020. What we see our provinces are investing more, British Columbia, Ontario, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and New Brunswick have made notable increases in their investments, in their percent of their investments in early education. However, how this money is spent is just as important in how, as how much is spent. We know that funding that goes to program operations results in building a quality ECEC system and is in fact associated with higher quality. Funding that goes to tax credits or parent fees do not build a quality system, but just address affordability. Our benchmark here was that at least two thirds of allocation goes to program funding. However, in Ontario, New Brunswick and Alberta did not reach this benchmark. They spend a significantly more amount of money on parent subsidies. Although we have seen increased funding across the country that I've shown you, we still see a large gap in operating expenditures per childcare space when we compare it to per child in school programs. Some regions have smaller gaps, such as Saskatchewan, but are also spending less per child or per space. Quebec is the only region in Canada where they spend more child in per child care space than they do per school programs. You heard much about the workforce last night. I hope you were all able to join. It was a very lively uh, discussion, so I won't spend a lot of time on this. However, it is important to note that ECE salaries across the country have generally, generally remained stagnant. Some regions have seen a decrease in salaries, such as Saskatchewan and Alberta, while others have seen increases not on par with other similar professions, such as teaching. As teacher salaries have gone up, while ECE salaries have remained stagnant, ECE salaries as a percent of teacher salaries has taken a nosedive. 
in all regions except Quebec and New Brunswick, we have seen an increase in this wage gap with some regions such as Ontario and Saskatchewan showing the biggest increases in this wage gap. We've spoken over the last few days much about auspice, about profitization of care and childcare. In 2017, we report that federal funding contributed to an uptick in for-profit care. The prospects of the substantial public dollars that were announced in budget 2021 has piqued even greater commercial interest. For-profit operators already dominate childcare, capturing over 50% of the market in seven of 13 provinces. This graph demonstrates across the editions of the report, the percent of childcare programs that are for profit. Of the 7 billion in public funding spent on 2020 regulated childcare, 43% went to for-profit providers. That's over $3 billion. Some premiers have already signaled an interest in expanding commercial care, arguing private sector efficiencies. Research into Quebec's two plus decade experience delivering different childcare models reveals the dangers of relying on for-profit providers. Public money needs to stay public. Here we can see the amount of public dollars by each province and territory that go into commercial sector programs. If not careful with the new 2021 budget, we will see an uptick in commercial operation and increased public dollars for for-profit organizations. I don't wanna end with shortcomings. So let's uh, look at some of the great things that are happening across the country. What are some positive things that are happening that are worth noting. As I mentioned before, school boards play a significant role in educating younger children and through kindergarten and pre-kindergarten. Full day kindergarten for five-year-old children is now offered in all regions except Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta. Full-time pre-kindergarten programs for four-year-olds are offered in Nova Scotia and the Northwest Territories. Quebec has committed to province-wide pre-K by 2023, the Yukon will have full day pre-K by September 2021. Newfoundland and Labrador, as well as Prince Edward Island, who delayed their rollout due to COVID-19, have plans to roll out their pre-kindergarten program, and none of it is piloting full day kindergarten. Federal funding can be used to leverage and support these school-based early learning initiatives. And I wanna talk a little bit about the great work coming out of the Yukon. There are many trend-setting examples. Although our report does not capture recent changes to the Yukon, the territory is making notable leaps forward in their programming, their affordability, and the territory partially credits the report as a guiding document. Yukon increased their wage top up to $17.11 an hour taking the median salary of ECs to the highest in the country. Parent fees have been slashed by $700 a month. Parents are now paying $200 a month. They have increased their funding for inclusion, moved oversight into the Ministry of Education, integrating services, and introduced new curriculum and monitoring tools. A small federal investment of 500 million a year has heightened attention for early learning and childcare. With New Brunswick, British Columbia, the Yukon and Northwest Territories announcing plans to create universal access for young children. Public investment grew by over $3 billion over the three year period and increased spaces by 100,000. We have seen positive changes in almost all regions and continue to see growth in quality across the country. Provinces and territories are drawing on their school systems to scale up access to early learning and care. Curriculum frameworks are now in place in all regions, although their use is mandatory in only seven. Several leaders have emerged, including Quebec, Prince Edward Island and New Brunswick, with many regions making notable positive changes this year that was not captured in the report. 
As we move forward with the promise of new federal dollars, one thing is unmistakably clear. We cannot take shortcuts. Quality must be at the forefront of expansion. Uh, I invite you to visit our website. It is now live, uh, ecereport.ca, to see the full methodology and detailed profiles on each of the 13 provinces and territories. Thank you so much. Please. Um... What an extraordinary accomplishment and our congratulations to you, Carrie, and the uh, team of people that have uh, worked this time and in the previous times to, to put these reports together. Um, what is, you know, my mother would have said all that in a bag of chips. So what is the significance of having this information centralized? How is it used? Um, how, how will it help to shape how um, our country moves forward? What's your experience and your opinion? Well, the report does fill a, a data collection gap. Um, we know the federal government has increased their interest in, in data collection, especially around early learning and childcare, but it is really filling a, a data collection gap. We need reliable data to help guide decisions, um, policy conversations, and the report highlights what investments province and territories are making, their governance structures, their accountability measures, their learning environments, and it allows regions to see best practices and identify service gaps. Ministries are increasingly more engaged in our additions and, and as our additions progress. Um, they tell us that they look forward to the report, that they use the report to see what other regions are doing, and many have told us that they use it as a guiding document for success. So I feel that as the additions have, have progressed, we've had a much more engagement and, and we're really seeing that the provinces and territories are using the report. Well, it really points to how measurement matters. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn the mic over to uh, Cecile Manat, who's going to uh, share what's going on in her part of the world. Morning, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. There we go. Um, I hope everyone can see this. It is indeed a pleasure for me to be here this morning um, and to be on this panel. I've learned so much from Dr. from my previous panelist presentation. And I also see some similarities that we have here in the Caribbean region. So I was asked to share some of what's happening here in our region. And um, I thought that it would be best as we look at the early years experience in the re here in the Caribbean, it's best that I take you back to give you a perspective as to who we are, for those of you who don't know us. So the Caribbean is actually made up of four nationalities, the English, the Dutch, the French, and also the Spanish. However, this presentation will be based on the English speaking Caribbean, which is where we do most of our work. And that is 16 different countries throughout the region. So we have um, Cayman, Bahamas, Jamaica, which is the largest country in the English speaking Caribbean. And we also take into account Belize and Guyana, which is a part of, a part of South um, America. So that gives you a landscape as what we're talking about as we move forward. And to give you some idea as to our history so that, I, so that you can see where we are now and if we've even reached, how, how much further have we? So when we look back at our history, um, the early childhood in the region developed out of a, a, a need where parents back in the 50s started to go back to work. And as they go back to work and employment was created, they started to look at what do I do with my children? Where do I take them? So child care facilities began and they began primarily as a private entity with individuals having a backyard in their home, as well as churches having, a, um, having persons and establishing a preschool. And so out of that, you could just imagine that there was no structure, there was no training. It was just a matter of us trying to provide a space for, for our young children under the age of six, because our primary school system starts at six. 
So the first private nursery was actually opened in Trinidad in 1934, years ago. And then in Jamaica, we had the first, what we call community basic school in 1938. So we're coming from way back where we decided that we needed to do something. And as we began to learn from our colleagues in the North, such as Canada and also in the United States, and look at some of the research coming out, we decided that, well, we needed to do more for our children and for our teachers. And so we learned that by enhancing what the learning environment and the quality of our, our teachers, the, the teaching, then we would be able to then see success in our children. So there was a rapid increase between then and over into the 1980s, a growing number of preschools. And our preschool is normally age three and four, three to five year olds. What we call daycare is the birth three months to, to, to two plus. And so we found, a, so private sector took over and the largest number was within the private sector. And we have different names throughout the region that we call our schools. We have daycares, we have creches, we have preschool centers, nurseries, basic schools, infant schools. But the way we distinguish them is by the age group. So daycares, creches, nurseries, birth to two plus, and the others are three to five. However, as we noticed that we were growing, the supplies were still inadequate. And so the region looked at how can we now organize ourselves and begin to offer more for the early childhood sector. But as we do that, we realized that we had no funding because similar to what my colleague just said, Government already had their hands full with the economic instability, um, our challenges that we have here. And so fortunately for us, we have funders who came to our rescue and UNICEF and Bernard Van Leer out of Europe. And they were the first to come to our rescue and say, okay, let's see how we can work with you. Um, and just to let you know that we still have issues with funding for early childhood. Um, early childhood is the lowest funding in any of our government. Uh, budget any of the region. Um, Trinidad has recently started to increase their budget and offer more government schools where they create a learning environment, but the rest of the Caribbean is still behind when it comes to. So similar to what you see, early childhood is not seen as the main thing within the budget. Large portion is given to primary, especially to um, um, our secondary and not our tertiary. Some is given to the tertiary, but that has been cut recently. So as we began to look at this, we realized that the government, and because of this, the government didn't monitor back then, but this has changed over the years as the budgetary increase. In Jamaica, we have formed the Early Childhood Commission, which is our regulatory body, and I'll tell you some more about that. So what UNICEF and Bernard Van Leer did for us was that they partnered with the University of the West Indies, where we where we recognized that we needed to offer our teachers who were not formally trained, we needed to offer. And so I don't know if any of you have heard of Dudley Grant, who is actually the, in the region, we call him the father of early childhood. And he worked with Bernard Van Leer and UNICEF and created a project, um, which we call the PEC, which is the Project for Early Childhood Education in Jamaica. And what he did was he developed a curriculum to provide ongoing in-service training for our teachers, also created teaching and learning materials because that was lacking in our region as well. And then started to do research as to how we can enhance the learning environment for our, for our um, children here. And this expanded because of the success of that particular project, it expanded into the rest of the region. So what you found is that now we had the empirical data to then say to our government, here, see, it is working. However, we still had issues even back then with all of what is going on, but it continues. We have continued to work with our, with our um, share and, and work with our government and um, to create an, a quality learning environment for our children throughout the region. UNICEF has continued to fund us within the region um, with, um, in early childhood. Bernard Van Leer has uh, moved 
but they have contributed quite a bit so um, that we have seen. So out of all of this, we had our first regional preschool, which is here at the, where I'm located at the Caribbean Child Development Center. And in Trinidad, we had Serval. And in Dominica, St. Vincent and the Grenadine, we had the CANSA, all initially funded through private entities. So our, or you could say that our early childhood system started out of the private sector with, with international funding. But however, as we grow and we see how vulnerable our population is, we have moved into um, the government have taken, has decided, okay, now we need to do some more things. And so what has happened with CARICOM, because we're all members of the CARICOM community, is that since the 1980s to the 1990s, we came together and we developed a regional guideline for actually developing early childhood services in the region. And so this has helped a number of our countries to implement a more comprehensive early childhood policy, um, to implement, to develop regulatory frameworks as well as to implement these frameworks. It has also assisted our, um, our our member countries in, in looking at how they can provide quality improvements, both with teacher training as well as in the learning environment. And um, this is what we have seen as we move on. So we're now coming together as one, trying to work together as one, using these guidelines to ensure that we offer the best for our, our um, early child. However, we still rely on funding from outside um, you know, our teachers, just like your teachers in Canada that was revealed in your report, are the lowest paid teachers. Our early childhood teachers are the lowest paid. Um, and we have been trying to justify for the longest while using all the research that we've been doing why we need to increase it. Um, it has increased by about one or two percent, but we still have not reached where we would like to go. We in the region have looked at many different ways as to how um, one of the first things we did with our birth to three, and this was years ago when we started the roving caregivers program, which is actually started in Jamaica, but has been rolled out regionally, is a home visiting program where we have caregivers that actually go into the home. And this was created because we recognized that the vulnerable communities or poor communities in the region could not afford the private daycares that we had. And so, this was funded initially by private, by our international funders. However, in some of our countries um, in the Eastern Caribbean, such as St. Vincent and St. Lucia, they have continued this today. So what they do is that they train um, caregivers to go into the homes and work with the parents and provide early stimulation for the children. Um, here in Jamaica, we have another program which is called Reach Up, which actually was developed in Jamaica through um, research, it, it, it shows the empirical evidence that early stimulation is, is definitely needed to enhance a child's success. And this particular program is now in um, I, a number of countries in Africa, um, in Europe, and we finally have it here back in Jamaica. Our Early Childhood Commission is, is rolling it out. Now, Reach Up can operate both with the parents within the early childhood or basic schools. But then it, it has a special thing to it because with it, we can offer it in what we call our baby well clinics. So we're reaching our parents before the child is born, beginning to teach them how to provide that early stimulation. And so we have come a long way from when I showed you in the beginning where we just had what we would call a babysitting to know that we're actually providing these things for our our, teach, our our parents to be able to provide that early stimulation. Um, throughout the region, um, some countries have specific curriculum, like here in Jamaica, we have a curriculum. Um, Trinidad has its own curriculum, but a number of the Eastern Caribbean has relied on adapting or adopting the high school curriculum. Now, um, we try to be play base, but you have to understand that the region is coming from a very high academic base. So we have parents who want our children to read and write at age three. And so what we have been doing is working with our parents to try and um, 
educate them as to the child development, how children learn and what is necessary at their various ages. And so because of that, we have integrated a parenting program in our early childhood programs where our practitioners work with parents to enhance, to, to, to educate them on where your child is at at this stage and what needs to be done. So that is actually integrated into our early childhood curriculum. Um, and in Jamaica, what we have done over the last couple of years is that we have pulled together, we have funded parenting places. And this is coming, this started as a project and the government has now taken it over, which is very fortunate for us. They have put together a parenting commission and this parenting commission is working with entities throughout the country developing parenting places where parents can actually go to get information on their children and also um, get training if they need in the various area for early childhood. Um, we're still trying to evaluate those programs. So um, I don't have statistics to show you at this time if that is really working, but hopefully in another two to three years we will because this is something that we recently started. And we cannot forget our partners, our international partners. George Brown College has been with us for over 20 years in, in the region, primarily in Jamaica. But whatever we learn in Jamaica, we take to the region. And so what, what they have been able to do with us is enhance the quality of our teacher learning environment. Um, we have learned a lot from the research that has come out of your, of your country as to how we can do better within our countries. We have taken that information. We have created undergrad degree programs. We have created graduate programs. We have created what we call continuing professional education programs for our teachers. And in using that and using what we have received, we have been able to um, also show the practical side of things. So, we at the university have a laboratory preschool and we've been using the whole play base and the learning through play in a practical way so that when you the theory is then attached to a practical this is something that's new here in the region because usually when teachers are trained you go straight into a lecture room you learn the things but there's no way for you to do it on the ground in the practical aspect so by collaborating with our entities um, we have been able to carry that into the country. And based on that, we have found that our government is willing now to take us, early childhood is what we call a buzzword. We have been able to do a lot more within our countries in the region because we have been showing them through research, through what we have created, that it does work. And we are continuing to do this as we move forward. And hopefully I'll have more research to show you on that. So it would be very... It wouldn't be good of me to complete my presentation without speaking to you about the impact of COVID. So as much as we have gone from where you saw us in the 50s to where we actually have been trying to work with our government, where we actually have um, a training program for our teachers trying to get improve the quality of the learning environment, here came COVID-19. From March of 2020, um, our preschools have been closed in the region. Um, in some of our countries, it never reopened face-to-face. -face. They continue to do online learning. In some of our countries, they have recently reopened. In Jamaica, because of how we have been handling COVID-19, our nurseries, which is the birth to three, have continued to be opened. And um, what has helped us is that the regulatory bodies, such as the Early Childhood Commission that we have here and the Ministry of Health in the region, they have created protocols that we have to follow. And so we have to ensure that we do the social distancing, ensure that our children wear the mask, we have sanitization throughout. Um, it works to a point, but as you recognize for our babies, you can't wear a mask. So then the pressure is placed back on the teachers to ensure that they themselves continuously wear their mask and the environment is created. We have recognized also that our young children are not getting the early stimulation that they should be getting because they're at home, 
and our parents are working from home. So the pressures, the added pressures of parents being able to provide that early stimulation is not working very well. And so we do recognize that when our children come back into the classroom, we will have, we will be stepping back to some of the, back to where we began with some of our children. Um, the older ones, the three, four and five, the three, four and five year olds have been doing online learning. And what we have found thus far is that they can only do two hours a day, one, two hours a day. And based on how our curriculum is, which is hands-on, the parents have to be with them. Even though the teacher is there, parents need to be there. So it has created quite an impact for us here in the region. Um, we are continuing to see how we can move forward. We are doing some studies now to find out the level of the impact it has had on our children and on our teachers. So we can begin to implement um, strategies to help recuperate. To assist our teachers, however, we have done a number of online training to teach them how to facilitate learning in the online environment, because this is very new to our early childhood practitioners. And so based on that, we have been able to assist, but it, it has been difficult as everywhere, but we will continue with everyone's help and with the research that we are now doing to see how we can continue to move forward. And so in a synopsis, that is the learning environment within the Caribbean as we move forward to the next level. And I want to thank you all. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Cecile. You know, um, as you, we have worked together for many years, as you identified, and I know that um, I've been privileged to be joined by a number of colleagues, uh, many who are around the screen, if you could see them, you know, Lynn and Gail and Colette, and, um, you know, we can speak firsthand to the absolute commitment of the early childhood workforce. Uh, we're most familiar with Jamaica, but the um, the many, many over the years, the hundreds of early childhood staff that would leave at 4.30 in the morning and travel by bus and uh, carpools for hours to come to um, a training in, um, in a 110 degree unair conditioned environment, I'm just saying. Um, so, you know, extraordinary commitment for decades. Um, and the way in which you've moved from an untrained workforce and straddled levels of training on a progression to a trained workforce has been um, really one to marvel at. But I think the most astounding thing that I want to point to and ask you to comment on, um, we, Lynn and colleagues, were present when Jamaica passed the Early Childhood Education Act. You have a yes. national commitment to early childhood. So when you talk about some of the challenges that you're facing, you really you need to, you know, be recognized and saluted and stand tall for the extraordinary um, national commitment to early childhood. I wanted to ask you, what did that do in terms of the, this national act and commitment to early childhood? What did it do in terms of galvanizing and moving your country forward? I think one of the primary things that it did was that it. As I mentioned before, government funding was not, early childhood was not in the forefront. Early childhood, you know, in the region, we have a saying, children must be heard and not seen. Must be seen and not heard, sorry. <laughs> but we're trying to change that, must be seen and not heard. And what the act did was to, to emphasize the importance of early learning and the fact that at this age, we need to put more into our young children which would then lead to less as they get older. You would then be putting less in as they got older. So what you found was then when we came up with the act, not only did Jamaica benefit, but we have a number of re our, our other colleagues within the region began to look to this act to see how can we now do such a thing within our country. So it gave us great pride we, we're the only country that still has an early childhood commission that actually is the regulatory body that guides us, that licenses us, that ensure that we follow certain standards. But the region looks to us to say, okay, so if you have this, how can we do something similar within us? So pride is a, a small word for what has happened because not only have we taught others what 
early childhood is all about, but we have been able to use that act, Patricia, to do some of the things that we're presently doing now. We have been able to use that to get the training that we need for our teachers to say to our individuals, our teachers need training. You cannot put someone in a classroom who's not trained and don't know exactly what to do. So it has been quite, quite an impact. And as you know, that was 10 years ago. So, so we have moved no, about 12 years ago. It's been so long, I can't remember. Right. And it has guided the rest of the region as to how they move forward. And the act explains everything, the learning environment, how you need to do what. And that that also guided us when we when we did the regional guidelines, Patricia. It was a it was a component of the regional guidelines. So it has led us in the Caribbean quite nicely. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to turn the screen now and invite Geraldine Lebro to, um, to present for us today. Welcome Geraldine. Thank you, good morning. Thank you for inviting me to share the urban perspective. Um, well, I have to say that on the other side of the Atlantic, we share many challenges and also the same vision as you have, uh, especially the need to uh, treat better the ECEC staff, to pay them better, to give uh, better working conditions, to train them um, before they start working and throughout their careers and so on. So we have many, many common uh, uh, ideas, I think. So I'm going to share my slide now to talk a little bit about um, the, the impact of the pandemic on uh, uh, the ECEC sector in Europe. Wait, I'm playing with my slide now. It worked during the rehearsal and now it's working again. Okay. Um, so before I start, I just wanted to say, uh, to give you a, a few elements of background about early childhood education and care in Europe. Um, and as I was asked maybe to, to look partly at um, the, the differences between public and private infra infrastructures and, and what difference that made into uh, the impact of the pandemic. I have chosen that map, uh, which uh, shows that throughout the European Union and, and even the, the countries next to it, uh, there is really a great diversity in how ECEC is organized. So here you see um, in red the countries in which private self-financing sector is significant. That means um, ECEC structures that don't receive public funding or even subsidies. So really private sector. So on the left side, you see that under the age of three years, there are even more uh, private settings than for the children aged three years and over. Um, and you see that it's very diverse across Europe. So for instance, in the Scandinavian countries who are always the best performers in Europe, um, there are only uh, public or publicly subsidized ECEC structures, for instance. And this is one map. I could see you many different maps looking at the training of staff, the qualifications which are required, uh, the way the system is organized, the entitlement or not, and the map would always be as diverse as this one. So just to say that um, I'm talking from a European perspective, but basically I'm talking from 35 different perspectives, <laughs> which makes it a bit difficult to, to say one thing. But uh, even if we have different systems, uh, we have agreed a European quality framework for ECEC. So this is a framework which was proposed by a group of experts in 2014. And in 2019, the 27 official members of the European Union have adopted it officially. So this is what is guiding every member state in designing their system um, through these five pillars. So what we are saying is that to achieve quality in early childhood education and care, you need to have these five pillars, which are more like a jigsaw. You can't have one pillar performing well and the others not. So the first one is about access, making sure that every child has access to a quality and affordable early childhood education and care, that there is staff in sufficient numbers and well-trained and who want to stay in the profession. We are saying that there should be pedagogical frameworks for all children, including the younger ones. 
that there should be a good monitoring and evaluation system in place to make sure that all of the actions, all the measures are uh, followed up and improved as we go on. And of course, that we need a really efficient governance system, and that is often uh, a weakest link. And we need adequate funding, and that is sometimes even a, a more we, um, a weaker link. So uh, this is what is driving everything we do uh, about early childhood education and care in Europe. Uh, and this is also the, the lens through which we look at the impact of the pandemic on the sector. So um, I wanted to tell you that we are working on two different analyses, which will be published hopefully during the summer. And we should have a webinar early September to present the results of this. So the first one uh, with the teddy bear is about documenting everything which is going on uh, in, the, in Europe looking at all the dimensions in all the countries. And then the other report is about analyzing uh, the lessons learned from the pandemic in five different countries or regions, which have different systems, either split or unitary, and, um, and who have different types of governance. So they are the experts doing this report are taking the European quality framework, which I described, and applying it to these five countries and regions trying to draw lessons on what has happened and how best we could perform uh, if ever there was another uh, crisis. So what I'm going to say today is coming from uh, this work. So what we are looking at uh, is looking at the impacts of the pandemic and I won't go into the detail of everything because there's a lot, uh, but basically we are looking at the impact on children's health and well-being. Um, acknowledging the fact that there has been um, a bigger impact on children who live in disadvantaged situations. There has been more violence, more an increase in domestic violence. We've seen also that children with disabilities have not been able to receive uh, the care that they needed, for instance. Um, that disabilities maybe have not been detected as early as they could have been in other times. So there are many different aspects that we are looking at under this children's health and well-being chapter. Then we are looking at the uh, learning by children. And obviously, as we're looking at the age range between birth and more or less six years old, um, there are many different things to look at. But one thing which is coming out is that we, it's very difficult to evaluate whether there has been a learning loss or developmental delays due to the pandemic. Um, that comes also from a much more general comment that I have to make is that there has been very little research made on the impact of young children than there have been on the impact of school age children. So it's very difficult to find uh, proper evidence and really a good evaluation of the impact uh, of the pandemic on children's learning. There seems to be a, a consensus which is, uh, which is coming now that many children have had problems, but they are fast to catch up as, long as, as soon as they come back to the normal environment. So we, we are still uh, looking into all the research. We're hoping that a few more are coming these weeks and, um, and we hope to have more solid arguments to, to make around children's learning. Then we're looking at staff and here there's a lot to say um, because we've been working on recruitment and retention and training of staff a lot. We've been looking at these different aspects and in terms of recruitment and retention, we see that a lot of ECEC staff are being really upset about the situation and about the way they have, be, they have been treated, uh, having to go to work uh, as frontline workers, but without the protection, uh, not being given priority for vaccination. And I think there was a big debate in Canada around that as well. Um, and I think there has been, the, there have been loads of frustrations which have been expressed in the press or by the trade unions, uh, which showed that this just added up to loads of frustrations which were already there in the way staff was treated. So um, that there is a fear that more and more staff want to leave the profession. So this is a big worry we have at the moment. 
Then we're looking at the kind of practices that have been happening uh, through the pandemic. And one uh, positive aspect is that staff have usually improved their digital skills like we all did. And uh, they have been developing new ways of working with families. Um, so that has been sometimes a really positive effect in terms of uh, supporting parenting, which was not always something very strong, but which has developed over the, the months. Uh, in terms of training, we've seen that uh, the pandemic has had a detrimental effect because many staff were not able to attend training that they were supposed to do. Um, young people who were training to get into the profession maybe were not able to actually do the traineeships that they were uh, going to do or to get the, their induction periods as, as they should have received. So this has been either delaying their graduation in the sector or maybe it has impacted on the quality of the training that they have received. Um, and then we've looked at teamwork and here again it could be something positive because teams sometimes have been reshuffled, they have learned their they have had to learn to work differently. And that has sometimes prompted some positive reaction in the sense that it was an opportunity to experiment different ways of working, which might be kept afterwards. Um, then I've put a point on the conception of the sector and uh, the impact of the pandemic has shown um, a worry amongst practitioners that we are going back to the babysitting. Um, perception of early childhood education and care. So during all the lockdown periods, uh, everything was organized so that parents who had to go to work went to work, but then there was a lot less attention given to children being able to receive the nurturing care and education that they needed. And here we are really hoping that um, this is not a lesson that policymakers learn, that early childhood education and care is not just essential for parents to go to work, but also it needs to uh, retain its inclusive and educational aspect, which means that we need well-qualified and well-trained staff. Um, then the impact of the pandemic on the settings and on the governance and funding of the sector, maybe I'll just go to the next slide now. Um, there's been a strong financial impact on ECEC settings. So across Europe, um, as you've seen, there are uh, still quite a lot of private settings and in some countries, like in uh, some uh, areas of uh, Canada, it's increasing. And of course, there has been a lack of income for some of them, especially during the lockdown periods. And there have been additional costs which have provoked financial difficulties for these settings. And in many countries, uh, there have been uh, measures from the government to the national or the local governments to support the structures to survive financially, but it's been very, very different across Europe. So in some countries, there was absolutely nothing to support the ECEC structures. And we know that some of them have collapsed and will never reopen. Um, we know that some others have um, not received enough uh, at the time or during a sufficiently long time. And uh, we are also seeing that uh, it's not just the private settings which are suffering, but also the public ones or the publicly subsidized ones, because they often are under the social affairs or health budget, not the education budget, which means that these ECEC structures have to share a global envelope with the social and the medical sectors, which obviously is very much in need at the moment which means that even the public ECEC structures might not receive the funding uh, that they need because it might be redirected to other priorities. So um, this is a little bit the, um, the, the picture around Europe at the moment. We are still working, as I said, on analyzing everything we've had, uh, but the general impact, the, the, the lessons that we have learned uh, is that the educational dimension of the CEC and the importance of the sector is not sufficiently recognized. We still need to progress on that. Um, we need uh, a lot more attention and professional guidance from policymakers. We need some more financial support. Also, we need more data and research, not just focus on schools, but also on the CEC. 
and uh, we need a good and efficient governance because we've seen that in countries where the, 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 the system is better organized, for instance, the, the guidance and the support went uh, arrived better and more easily to the practitioners instead of getting lost in different layers of governance and decision making. So that was really important. Um, and this is really the, the broad lessons that, uh, that we are drawing at the moment. So I will uh, take uh, one minute to do a little bit of uh, commercial advertisement on um, what we are doing in Europe around ch uh, early childhood education and care. So based on this uh, general agreement that we need more support, what we are doing is um, a series of webinars at the moment to present two documents that we have, um, that has come out of this working group, which I have been coordinating for the past two years. One is a toolkit for inclusive early childhood education and care. And it's full of ideas and resources and examples of how European countries address uh, inclusion. And the other one is on how to recruit, uh, retain and motivate and train uh, well-qualified ECEC staff. And these, uh, these reports, as well as the ones I have uh, mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, will be available uh, where you see them, uh, this uh, website. Uh, you also have an email address where you can contact me if you have any question or would like to work with Europe. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Geraldine. Um, there has been some research that's come out of um, Ontario's public health looking at the impact of um, COVID on young children's um, wellness, well being particularly the focus on mental health and it's aligned to what you have shared, um, serious uh, issues that have um, been documented on uh, children's, young children's expressions of anxiety, uh, feelings of isolation, um, increased um, trauma in the home and in terms of family discourse and uh, increased violence and um, which is really going to lead for lead for practitioners as a, as a sector to think about what do we need to do to be ready to have these children come back? How, how is the sector prepared to um, have children return? The uh, young children, infants, toddlers, and preschools have been attending care, but the uh, six, five-year-olds five and up have been um, online and have not been in, in programs. That's the area where children have uh, demonstrated the most um, impact, negative impact in terms of anxiety. Um, and we have a lot to do in the sector um, to be ready. It's not about just opening the doors and, and going back to what was. Um, we all have work to do uh, as, a, as a profession to um, be ready to um, support the, the, the children. And we, as you identified, surveys have showed the sector is indeed exhausted. I think the early childhood sector is exhausted all over the world. Um, so there's much to do. Wondering, um, in terms of the work you've been doing, which countries do you think are in the best position to recover? Loss of income, loss of revenue, loss of this uh, teacher staying in the profession. Who, who, which areas do you think would be positioned best for recovery? Um, well, it's so diverse, it's difficult to say, but in general, it's clear that the, the countries which are already performing, performing well in terms of um, uh, an efficient governance, um, a unitary system rather than a split system are doing much better when the early childhood education and care sector falls under the, the umbrella of the education sector that already gives a priority to it. Um, and I think in general, all those countries which are uh, looking at ECEC as an educational and inclusion, inclusive um, and aspect and also an investment into the future are still giving priority. So it's not only a matter of how the system is organized, but it's also a matter of how you consider early childhood education and care. And if you look at the Scandinavian country, they also have this interesting perspective that they look at ECEC under the angle of child's rights. 
And because they consider it's a right, then they have made sure that the children receive what they are entitled to. And that makes a big difference. And that is just a symbol showing that the angle under which you look at something will make the whole difference. So it's all about how the policymakers will, will consider ECC. And this is why we, we just need to keep advocating for how important this early childhood is. Thank you. Um, we're, we're going to take some time now to direct some questions to individual panelists and, uh, and um, all the, our panel members can certainly respond. I want to remind uh, those of you, all of you who are here to um, please use the Q&A function on your screen and not the chat. Um, we have been gathering questions. Uh, my colleague our colleague uh, Daniel Foster from Atkinson will be looking at questions. And when we get to that point, uh, we will go to some new questions. So we're gonna start off, I think, um, Amis, by asking you the first question. Um, your report highlights both provincial and territorial investments, as well as those from the federal government. What role do you believe municipalities play as we discuss the federal funding? Municipalities can play a vital and critical role in, in the Pan-Canadian plan, recognizing that complex interjurisdictional issues may delay uh, a fully developed Pan-Canadian uh, early uh, learning and childcare system. Uh, there are concrete ways the government of Canada, with the support of municipal partners, can take significant and uh, decisive actions to help address some of the challenges that we see in the ELCC sector. Um, municipalities are already uh, interested and involved in many aspects of their local uh, ELCC sectors. Um, their roles in, in planning, um, building uh, on their existing schools and other public uh, sector partnerships, uh, land use, um, their uh, local economic uh, development to move initiatives forward uh, more quickly. Capital projects can also uh, take advantage of empty uh, public spaces. So they can really also prioritize the needs of underserved um, groups, uh, which is a big challenge in early learning. And these are areas that are not often attract, uh, they don't attract for profit and even nonprofit uh, sectors. If, if it was, then we would have seen these net needs met before. So I think municipalities can play a vital role and, and I think that they, they need to be at the negotiation tables. I just want to remind everybody that all the uh, presentations will be posted on the Atkinson site because I can see there's some questions about how to access some of the links that have been presented. So uh, check for the um, Atkinson site. Um, Trillian, I'm going to, uh, we have a question that's directed to you to start with is um, both the experience and research have demonstrated that early childhood education benefits children, families, and the society at large. So we've established that. And we also know that some Canadians are skeptical of a government funded system that they don't directly benefit from. Maybe they haven't had any children or their children are all grown up or they don't need care for their children. So how does childcare for all truly benefit everybody? And what can it mean for society going forward? I think we're always coming back to that same perspective. We need to shift the narrative. It's not care for people who need a service, it's investment in our future citizens. Uh, and this is si as simple as that. So you, you pay for schools, why wouldn't you pay for early childhood education and care? It's just exactly the same thing. And so it, we know that people who, are, uh, who receive higher levels of education and skill from an early age, they will do better in school, they will have better health, they will have better employment prospects and everything. So it, it's, it's just about changing the narrative. So these people may not have children, but they're still paying for schools. So went for early childhood education and care. Mm, thanks. Cecile, as a bit of a follow-up, so how can we make sure that the investments in early learning and care are accessible to and benefit lower income and vulnerable families. Thank you. So as Geraldine says, once we change the narrative and the narrative is changed to say, we're investing in our children and this is where we see it is. 
Research has also shown that if you invest in vulnerable communities, crime level will fall. This is, this is there, it's been tested, it's been shown. And so what I think we need to do is begin to look at that situation and invest in our vulnerable communities. We have been working, for example, with the Rovian Caregivers Program, where the funds are directed to those who cannot make it to the private institution, cannot make it out, go into the communities and work with the individuals in there, direct the funding into that aspect of it. Um, once we understand, change a narrative, we need to invest in children and also understand that the investing at this level will also change how crime and violence is in your society, the kind of adults that are in your society. So we need to go into the communities, spend the money. If it means having a class within, I mean, I can tell you of one situation that took place here in Jamaica with a teacher, one teacher, and the copy speak up commitment, one teacher who decided Everything is online, but his children are in the poor communities and they're not able to go online. So he made photocopies, got private sector to invest in photocopying. He went into the community with the paperwork. Everybody had on their masks, use up a whiteboard within the community and was actually teaching in the community. And I think if, if more of us invest in things like that, then we will be able to reach the, the vulnerable and the poor of society. Thank you. Your mic is muted, Patricia. Oh, Patricia. <laughs> Sorry, I think we've been battling over the mic. My apologies. Um, and Julian, you, certainly you've pointed to some of the uh, concerns or some of the impacts of the pandemic. Uh, will others continue to follow up on uh, commenting on what troubling trends have you seen as a result of the pandemic um, specifically, or what have the, been some of the troubling trends you've seen in the last few years? Mm, Amis, I'm gonna start oh. with you. Okay, uh, troubling trends. Um, well, from, from our report, uh, what is, is really troubling is the few things. A few, one is the uptick in the for-profit uh, sector. Um, we know that with this new federal funding increase has has peaked um, and, and we've also seen through the pandemic what privatization of care does and, and what quality it serves when we've seen um, the examples from long term care so we cannot let that happen in child care. So that, that's troubling, especially with the federal announcement, we know that that peak has, in, uh, has the interest has peaked. The other one is, is EC salaries. It, you know, some of the data we, you know, we were shocked to see that they just not only have they not gone up, but some cases they've gone down. And when you think about inflation and cost of living for salaries to have gone down is, is truly alarming. We are in a workforce, EC workforce retention and recruitment crisis. We are currently at approximately 40% access of zero to five uh, year old children across the country. With the new federal announcement, we are looking to more than double the access. So expansion is going to happen fast. We cannot allow reduction in qualifications um, and, and ratios of qualified staff to be the way we accommodate. And we're already in that crisis of professionalization, valuing the work of early childhood educators. And with the attempt to expand quickly, um, we fear that, that um, definitely we will see an, uh, a reduction in qualifications, which as we all know here, this is an audience that knows this all too well, that is going to greatly impact quality. And it will have even more ECs leaving the sector. They are already leaving the sector in, in alarming numbers because they are not valued because they don't have professional pay. So these are, these are two really concerning trends that um, have come out of uh, our findings. It's really interesting, Andrew. In what world would we accept that our healthcare professionals should have lesser qualifications because it's hard to find a nurse? You know, it would just not even be um, a consideration. In Ontario, uh, the, the demand for PSWs has resulted in uh, a big investment in training of PSWs, including tuition funding and um, 
that didn't take a significant uh, uprising to have happen. Yet we seem to be numb and willing uh, to accept, you know, lowering qualifications and a host of, uh, of a host of other solutions that would not be considered acceptable in any other sector. Um, Cecile, have you, uh, what have been some of the, if any, troubling concerns that have come in your, in the Caribbean as either the result of the pan <clears throat> pandemic or trends that you've seen emerge that have been of concern? Well, similar, some of what Ennis has spoken about. One is the, the trend of the salaries. And we do have a number of our early childhood practitioners actually leaving the sector. Because, you know, the thing about our workforce here is that they're committed to early childhood. So they have gone ahead and they have invested in education. So they've gotten their degrees. They've, they've upgraded themselves to a place where they said, okay, now I'm here. What happens next? But we have not increased their salaries. Um, so that is one of the biggest trends, and we have tried over the years to see how we can do that, and we will continue. But that is one that we see that continues to 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 well haunt us is the word because we may have um, now the practitioners are all having their bachelor's degree. Previously, we didn't, but the salaries are not matching up to a bachelor's degree. So when you have a bachelor's degree at the primary level, you earn that much more than at the early childhood sector. And so we're still trying to convince everybody. It, as you said, Patricia, it is the same. You can't ask, you have to have qualifications to do what you need to do. So that's one of the trends that we're seeing. Another trend that we're seeing is that, um, and the fact that they're leaving. Another trend that we're seeing is that um, the, the, we are still, not really creating the learning environment for our early ch early childhood children. In some areas, we have moved towards the learning centers, but we're still academic based. Where we where the it's where rather than it being child centered, we're still chalk and talk as we call it. We're the teacher. We're teacher driven. So that's one of the trends and challenges that we're having here um, within the the region. But we're working to see how we can change it. Thank you. Um, and then if we shift this, <clears throat> what are some of the positive trends that you think are worth noting? Um, Geraldine, have you, uh, in terms of the work that's happened in, in Europe, are there some positive trends that you would be able to share with us? There were the very few positive things which I mentioned, but improving um, teamwork, uh, liaising with families is really a big one. Something interesting also which has come up is recognizing uh, the importance of, well, the, the interest of doing outdoor learning. Uh, this is something, again, the Scandinavians do a lot, but most of the more southern people just stay inside as soon as there is a drop of rain, you know. <laughs> it's not like Canada, I think you are not scared by these sort of things, but, uh, but across Europe, outdoor learning is something still quite new, and this has come out as, as something interesting. Uh, but to be frank, I'm not super optimistic at the, at the moment. I find it very difficult to draw positive lessons from the, from the situation. Um, apart, apart from the fact that because the crisis is so big that there is a big um, mobilization, you would say that in English, mm -hmm. of, 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 uh, of the sector, of the researchers, I think the NGOs, I think we're all starting to speak up louder mm -hmm. because the needs have been there for a long time, but now it's just so bad that really we need to be heard. Mm -hmm. So I think this might be one positive outcome. Yes, I think that we would see that um, at home here in terms of uh, our, pro our city, our province, and clearly our country with the announcement of um, federal dollars and the um, galvanizing of the sector um, is certainly has, has come to the surface. And to your point, Geraldine, um, people have been focusing on outdoor learning uh, for a while now, and the pandemic has really uh, lifted that and um, emphasized the, not only the value, but the potential 
of, um, of an outdoor land-based um, approach to uh, having our children spend more time. And clearly in Jamaica, Cecile, for heaven's sake. Well, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. We've, we've always had a battle with outdoor learning, um, but yes, they're fortunately, and, and I can say that because we have year own son, but for some reason, our teachers just wouldn't send our children out. But that had, the pandemic has brought that on. And another trend that we have found is the commitment of our teachers to learn how to teach online. That we have found here in the region. Um, we did a webinar in April of this year for 40 practitioners. It was open for 40 practitioners. We had over 400 practitioners registered. And that show you that the interest of them trying to say, okay, what can I do to help my children? How can I move forward? So that, that, that to us just blew us away. And this was through CARICOM and UNESCO. And um, so we're trying to see how we could do some more of this. So that was a, a good positive trend. And the fact that we're, we are using our outdoors a little bit more now. <laughs> Indeed. Um, we certainly, through the presentations, the, the disturbing trend about the, uh, in an increase in um, for-profit commercial operators has been raised. And wondering, a question here that has come forward is, um, what have regions done to contain the growth of for-profit commercial operators? Have there been any successes where, where areas have been able to contain the growth and expansion of the, of the commercial sector? Ready be able to... Uh, I can I can uh, start just from the Canadian perspective. Um, we we have seen in Canada, you know, some things that have been done, positive things. Uh, Prince Edward Island and New Brunswick provide examples of how public funding for childcare can be tied to strong standards for commercial providers, and that reduces the uh, for-profit incentive. Um, expanding pre-kindergarten uh, and requiring schools to offer extended uh, hours of care for their students removes a large portion of the childcare market from, from uh, corporate access. Uh, Nunavut and Northwest Territories and Saskatchewan restrict their childcare funding to public and nonprofit programs. So these are some ways that uh, jurisdictions in Canada have, have tried to curb expansion. But in Europe, are there particular successful strategies uh, for curbing commercial childcare? Not that I'm aware of. I think there, there is actually a dangerous trend of some countries or municipalities who want to answer to um, to to answer the demand from parents to have childcare, and they want to create more and more places just to say we have created places and there is childcare and so they just give it to the private sector. So there, this is something we are actually trying to, uh, to look at at the moment. Um, this is something which is not yet huge, but it's coming up actually. So we're not yet at the stage of finding uh, counter <laughs> uh, productive uh, strategies to, to avoid that this happens. Mm -hmm. so, mm. Thanks. Cecile, in the Caribbean, are there any initiatives to either enhance um, government funding like infant schools in Jamaica or strategies to a curb or disincentivize the uh, commercial market? Um, in the region, we, well, unfortunately, we do rely on private sector, especially because some of the countries, the governments do not fund the birth to three-year-olds. And so what you find is that we do rely on the private sector to do that. Here in Jamaica, you know, we do have our basic schools and our nurseries that we do, but the numbers are not that large. So what the government is doing here is that they're trying to increase that. And as they increase that, then our private entities would have less of a, a, a demand. Um, in Trinidad, what they have been doing, the government has been doing is increasing the number of preschools, government preschools. So because the government preschool, preschools are not um, so accessible, is that that is deterring the private sector from bringing in more private entities. But unfortunately, in some of our smaller islands, they do have to rely on the private sector because the governments are not able to fund that the, the younger age group. And they can only fund a number of um, 
institution. But what they what we do is that we provide the, the regulatory framework to, uh, to help to say, okay, you need to stay within this framework and, and they do have to adhere by it, which helps us here. Great, thanks. Uh, Daniel, I'm gonna to turn to you. Is there a qu another question from the, um, the audience? Yeah. Um, one participant asks, what can we do in terms of communi uh, in terms of communication that our respective uh, uh, what can we do in terms of communicating to our respective communities to understand and buy into the importance of universal child care and see it as a benefit to all? So maybe we can start with um, Geraldine on this. I think there are lots of international studies which show the, the return upon investment on early childhood education and care. So that's not necessarily a way we like to look at it, but this is a good way to convince policymakers and decision makers on those who give in the finding. So uh, I think uh, we, we have J James Heckman, of course, who's with these famous studies, but we also have the OECD uh, studies, which are demonstrating the impact of uh, investing in early childhood education and care, and how, for instance, it provides positive return when we look at the PISA studies. So I think we have loads of elements. We just need to, to um, devise a communication which speaks to all. So adapt your argumentation to your audience. Some people will be sensitive to the child rights argument, some others to the inclusion, some to the investment in the future workforce and so on. So there are loads of different arguments. You just need to pick the right one for the right audience, I would say. Great. Does yeah, anybody that's want that's to respond to this as well before we go to another question? Uh, I, I could respond to that. I, I think that's a very important question. I think public education is vital. This is in democratic countries. This is who votes decision makers in. Um, and I absolutely echo uh, Geraldine's comment, different audiences require different em emphasis. Um, often when we talk to politicians, we use Heckman and Pierre Fortin's work and Alexander Craig's work and, and really talk about return on investment. Uh, when you talk to parents, you talk about quality and the importance of supporting young children. Uh, and so at times where we have um, unresponsive uh, governments <laughs> in a uh, position of power, we really do focus our attention to public education because we know that sometimes advocacy uh, to governments that are not responsive will just lay on deaf ears. So it is so important and I, I appreciate that comment about um, how important public education is in, in, in what we're trying to do. Daniel, is there another question from the uh, yeah, um, so I guess this is in the, uh, we, we've been talking a lot about uh, the risks of privatization and the benefit of uh, uh, public early childhood education. And one participant asks, is there a risk of privatizing ECE training, um, much like the uh, privatizing uh, childcare? Uh, so the risk being looking to pump out numbers of educators and perhaps reducing the quality of training in the graduate skill level, especially as we focus on one or two year training programs and not degree programs. So do we see that, do you envision that risk of privatization uh, popping up in the future? Uh, I can speak to this first if, if um, my fellow panelists don't mind. I, I think that's a huge risk, especially in this climate in Canada today. We are looking to expand at an alarming rate, a historical announcement. Um, and so, and we are already in a workforce crisis. And as Patricia uh, mentioned uh, earlier in, uh, you know, personal support workers, they have seen investments in tuition, supporting enrollment, uh, and we're not seeing that yet in, in ECE. And if we don't see that in our colleges and universities, then that will leave a huge gap for, for for-profit organizations to come in and fill that gap. So I, I think it is an absolute vital piece and it is the role of, of governments to, um, to address this um, in our universities and colleges, as well as it is for our colleges and universities to address. And I think, thanks for that question. That's a very important one. 
Okay, we're coming towards um, time has not been in our favor. So I think I'm just going to pause now and I'm going to ask um, each of the panelists um, to have a minute or so to perhaps um, send us off with a, a parting message, either drawing on your own experience or what advice you might have for Canada as we move forward with a national care plan. Um, so Geraldine, what advice do you have for us? Well, look at what's going to happen in Europe in a couple of weeks. Uh, hopefully the member states will agree to uh, providing free early childhood education and care to vulnerable children across Europe. So this is something which is on the table and on the 14th of June, we are hoping that they adopt what we call the child guarantee. And this is uh, an idea that they should put in place any measure possible so that all vulnerable children have free access to early childhood education and care. So th this is the positive message I have and hopefully this is adopted and, 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 and that will inspire Canada. Thank you. Cecile, some parting words of advice? Well, for us to remain positive and continue to advocate on behalf of early childhood in where, whichever country we are. Because based on what we've said, we all have similar problems. We all, it is a massive education. We have to continue the advocacy, especially for investment in our early childhood sector. And I think for all of us, that's just what we have to do. Come together as a sector and speak even louder. We've been speaking, but I think if Canada, the Caribbean and Europe come together as one and say, listen, this is what we're saying, then I think that it will force them to listen to us. We have to continue the advocacy. And that's my part in words. Thank you. Um, I echo my, my colleagues on the panel. COVID-19 has rocked the early childhood education sector that was already unstable and uneven. Uh, as we emerge from this pandemic, we have to do better. Children have endured delays, uh, learning delays. Many have seen worsening mental health, as we heard from uh, Nicole and Karen on, on the first day of the Institute. Early education is key to the recovery of not just of our economy, but also our children and our families. We have to address equality as we expand. Um, this, you know, we have seen lessons from Quebec on what happens when expansion and affordability are at the front of conversations and, and workforce participation. We have to address equality. And with that, most importantly, is the qualifications of our educators. They vary greatly across the country, as do ratios of qualified staff. There is no jurisdiction in Canada that requires all of their staff to be qualified. This is a standard we would never tolerate in our education system. So we must be careful not to take shortcuts. We must support our educators. We must put children at the center of policy discussions. We must pay attention to quality. We cannot go back to the status quo. Oh, what a passionate <laughs> plea from all three of you. So on behalf of the entire team, Dan and I thank you, Amis, Cecile, and Geraldine for your uh, incredibly informative and engaging presentation. Um, and to end with this notion of advocacy um, and commitment and passion, uh, there is no better way than to introduce um, our uh, Jane Mercer. So we um, invite Jane to come on screen as we thank our panelists. Jane, I know you're in the room. Are you able to put your camera on? Hi. You can't see me all this time? Yes, we can. That's terrific. You can? That's okay. wonderful. So everybody, <laughs> I know that you uh, are we're expecting us to uh, introduce Jane Mercer to you. It is so strange to be doing this and not to be doing this with uh, a round of applause and a, and a glass of wine, but um, this is our world today, right? So um, I'm introducing you for those who have not had the pleasure to meet Jane Mercer. Um, Jane Mercer is an early child educator and I proudly say a graduate of George Brown College. And her, her early career in the early childhood sector, she was the director of the St. Lawrence Cooperative Daycare. 
Uh, she developed her love of community and community organizing in what turned out to be one of Toronto's biggest triumphs in a highly successful, fully functioning mixed age group, mixed income community. Uh, the program grew to three centers and over 200 children uh, age ranging from infancy to 12 year olds. But one of why Jane is so well known for us, to us all, is through her work as the executive coordinator of the Toronto Community for Better Childcare, known to those in our region as the TCBCC. So Jane was a strong voice for childcare, for families, and for educators for 20 some years. And in her retirement, Jane continues to advocate on behalf of families in Toronto and for the need for affordable transit, for affordable housing, and for affordable childcare. And for those of us um, around the screen who've had the privilege to uh, work with Jane over the years, um, we would, my mother would say she is no shrinking violet. <laughs> I know that I have been in situations where I think, hmm, is, am I not going to exactly be on the same point of view as Jane? And am I ready to face that? Because you were and continue to be um, relentless in your commitment, conviction, and perseverance in all things important for children, for families, for the early childhood sector. So um, please join all of us today, Jane, in recognizing your contributions for uh, being a champion for equity, for being a champion for quality in early childhood education and care. And if we were on a stage, we would present you with your plaque, which I hope yeah, you received. I have received, I have received. So uh, we salute you and um, invite you to uh, say a few words. Well, thank you very much, Patricia, for such, um, such a lovely and passionate uh, intro there. Her and I have worked on uh, the same issues from different corners in, in a packed room of 200 here or there. Um, when I say different corners, uh, always in the same direction. Um, just who, who's gonna be speaking up in this in this uh, room, um, many times it was Patricia, uh, but sometimes it, it had to be me uh, because I was speaking from the point of view of the community. I really um, uh, learned this job from the ground up, uh, working with children and parents and families and the workforce. And as the director of the St. Lawrence co-op daycare, recognizing how important the children, parents, workforce, and is to a strong, strong start for our kids um, because they can't do it on their own. They've got to be in strong families and they've got to be in a strong community. Then that also led me to pay attention to the, that municipal level of politics, which in Toronto, because I think we've got 40 Ontario's childcare in Toronto with a system managed by uh, the municipal government, it did become really important to hold their feet to the fire. And we had some great wins. We, you know, fought for free rent and hung on to that rent in our schools. Oh my goodness, we had to hang on for dear life uh, to keep that. Um, we fought for, although very quietly, but we got it through um, uh, uh, the uh, legislation that would contain the growth of for-profit childcare. That was the time I learned that by doing nothing but really quietly sabotaging the opposition's voice, we win what you're looking for at, at the City of Toronto. Got, um, legislation that will contain that growth, even when they're obliged um, by um, pass on grant to a community, um, to the uh, commercial programs, uh, we managed to get it contained that the, the quality would apply to them rigorously enough that, eh, well, they either have to step up or step away from the grant. 
So it will be interesting now that we have had this um, excellent victory at the federal level. And for that, it's thanks to the advocates from coast to coast, at the municipal level, in our uh, academic institutions, um, our politicians, our uh, city managers, uh, parents across the country that have fought and fought and fought. And I like to think that, you know, every generation, there's another generation of parents, uh, Canadians, who understand how we have to have early childhood. So it's a fight that's got, been going on for decades that I was very honored to be a piece of. Um, ask me, uh, what keeps you going? Uh, how do you keep fighting for something? When we're not getting it, we're not getting it. I always remember this line that said, "'Tis not our victories, but our glorious defeats um, that will keep us going. And it did keep us going. And now we have had a glorious victory this mm -hmm. year, mm -hmm. but we got to hang on to it and we're have to fight at that provincial level, the municipal level, certainly in the public opinion that when you invest in our kids and our community, you know, we're all. So thank you so much, um, Patricia, for um, introducing me uh, today and for this great, um, you know, great honor. It came a year after I retired. I Because we I, didn't have the, we didn't have the I know. last year. <laughs> I, I left, I retired on March 6th. Yeah, yeah, my only focus was I have got to get out because the city budget was done. And the <laughs> province, provincial budget hadn't happened yet. And I have to get out before it gets wild again. Yeah. But I got out March 6th and March 13th everything imploded mm -hmm. and I thought of you all often. Well, thank you so much, Jane, for being here today, uh, for the, your many contributions. And I know that we, and I hope we'll continue to have uh, many opportunities to work together and that we'll continue to benefit from your expertise and from your vision. Thank, thank you. you. Alrighty. So I'm going to, uh, we would have applauded if we were on stage. <laughs> I'm going to call upon uh, Dr. Jenny Jenkins, the chair of the Atkinson Center now to come on stage and, um, you know, provide some closing remarks and, uh, and send us on our way. So thank you. Thanks very much, Patricia. So I will, I promise you, I will speak for no longer than five minutes. Uh, I want to thank everyone who has been involved in organizing the Summer Institute, and most of all, Jen Santino and Stacy Moody, who are extraordinary administrators with knowledge and vision about moving the Summer Institute online, and that's been great. Uh, so thank you for your work. But also to thank the members of the Atkinson Center, my colleagues, it's a 20 year collaboration between George Brown College and U of T, which I've learned so much from and value so deeply. I want to thank Amis Akbari, Carrie McQuaig, Bernice Ciparone, and, uh, and Patricia Chorney Rubin for their extraordinary knowledge and commitment to making the lives of children and families better. Um, and really thanks to all of you, uh, to our speakers, to our audience, with the extraordinary commitment that you've shown in a Zoom environment. And I really appreciate this. And you've given us these themes. Um, we have a moment of opportunity as we build back from the effects of the pandemic. We've heard about the moral imperative that settler Canadians have to be led by Indigenous people to address the adverse effects of colonization, particularly with the news out of Kamloops this week. We've heard about inequality from and uh, passionately spoken about with data and knowledge from Nicole, Dawn, Armin, the inequality of opportunity that we've seen during the pandemic 
And it's really an exacerbation of the problems that we have we know exist in Canada for a long time. The inequality due to colonization, ethnicity, more generally gender, the effects of the pandemic on women and the BIPOC population, we have to pay attention to that. And the inequality that we've seen for the early childhood workforce, we have not given sufficient respect to all those in our society who focus on the relational aspect of the society and this we have to change. So what do we do? We've heard that early development is the stronger, strongest predictor of later development. We have now heard that over and over. The quality of interactions that children have in the early years is the most modifiable, modifiable aspect of the environment, something we can powerfully do something about. How educators and parents talk to children, love them, respond to them. So if we want an adult workforce that really works well, we have to pay attention to our workforce and this early childhood period. This is not babysitting as we build back from COVID. This is the centrality of making a workforce, an adult workforce that works. So this period from zero to five, we have to put everything we've got into that so that we have a society that functions well as, as those young children grow up to be the adults in our society. We've heard about the importance of data, how comparative data helps us to understand where our systems weak. It helps us to monitor our progress and measurement. That's one aspect of measurement is at the macro level. The other aspect of measurement is at the micro level. The quality of educator child interaction how do we measure it? How do we improve it? We need to be working on that all the time. This is a multi-level commitment and a multi-level issue. And we've heard about that. So it is at uh, the society level, nationally and internationally and it's at the micro environment level of children's everyday experience. In terms of macro level systems, what are our take homes? And we've heard these from Maureen, Shanley, Kerry, Cecile, Geraldine, Amisa, Lana, Isabel, Karen, and Glory about how collaboration across levels of, of the government and legislation is central and the integration of service. So what do we hear? We hear that a publicly funded system is imperative because that's how we build access, uh, how we make the uh, experience for children more equitable. We need pre-K. Uh, we pay for schools and we value that in our society. Let's pay for pre-K, let's value that. Um, we need to, uh, I'm, I'm thinking we need to pay attention to the Yukon's visionary moves. We need to pay attention to what the European Commission is trying to do. All right, let's think about also quality on the ground for the moment to moment interactions. How do we do that? We pay attention to training. We heard about that from Cecile, Isabel, Glory, Shanley, Karen. We properly compensate the workforce, Alana, Kerry, Amis. We fight for that as that helps support the well being of the workforce and it maintains the workforce. This highly skilled 
group of educators in their jobs. We have to maintain that. So what did I learn from the Summer Institute? Uh, I learned about the importance of advocacy for the respect for the diversity of our community. BIPOC, those who are vulnerable in our society with disabilities, women, children, and this workforce that we have not given enough attention to. So thanks so much. I, I really thank people for what they did for us over these four days, so thank you. Back to you, Patricia. Thanks so much, uh, Jenny, and, uh, and to all. So wishing you all a good year. Keep the fight, keep focused, and uh, we will pay attention to the important elements that you've identified, and we are primed for good things ahead. Um, see you all next year. Be well, be safe. Bye-bye.